support structure, they're orphans. Okay, and then number two, there's a giant mansion over there surrounded by trees. And neighbors have for many years complained that there are always these giant, uh, uh, or these huge gay parties, but not just raves, not just a typical gay party, because there would always be fully armed paramilitary guards. And it would always only be elite and very wealthy that were invited and people as judges. And we think even like the same judge that dismissed all the lawsuits and wouldn't find anybody liable, this same judge would have been at those parties. And like other sites associated with Jeffrey Epstein, there's a private airport that's very close to the whole site. So they can fly people in, have them do their child trafficking thing. Some of them we think then were brought over here, photographed, uh, even in the uh, machine shed, and um, you know, and then they would fly out on the private jet. So it would be so it would basically be undercover. The whole operation, the whole system, and the name of that airport was called uh, was called Christ. I think it was blasphemous because they put Christ's name in it, but but the, in what they were using it for. But it was I don't remember the whole name, but it was Christ Landing or, or something along that line. So this was the shelter here? Yeah, no. The shelter is back past that. Back see, here? Yeah. Now, do you see how that kind of looks like an empty basement back there? But on the left-hand side of it, there's like sheet metal over the top of it. You right, see? this here, right. Yeah, so that's the shelter, okay? And then the school bus was part of a tunnel leading from the Right building. here? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay, and then this over here, this red is what? That was sheet metal that they put over top of that shelter, and I think it was a little bit rusty. Okay, and this was a big hole. So that, yeah, that's the, like, like that big basement. Oh, you saw that over there, didn't you? I couldn't really see, and I wasn't going to go over there. I right. could just see the where it's going to start to go down, but I couldn't yeah. see. So. Okay, so. It, it, it is, over, but it is, you know where it is, though, so that it's over there. Oh, there by the school, but I can't, yeah. couldn't, you said don't go past the sign. No, you, you can, you can. Just so, what I said, and I I might not have spoken real clearly. You can go all the way as much as you want. We just are here. Just don't step directly on the school bus. Gotcha. That's what okay. it looks like. But you can like. go close enough where you can see it, take pictures of we it. You can go close enough. Okay. It's not, the ground isn't unstable. So that's what you feel like. Over. You so, can walk up to where you can see that is what burned down. Don't so just this part of the building. Mm -hmm. This this little part, it's the only part that didn't burn down. All that burned down. And we're standing right now. Inside okay, of so we, this we is part right here, yep. so the buses and stuff right over here. Yep, that's dope. So, see, and that's the part that burned down. So basically, uh, uh, to give you guys an idea, it looks like you're figuring a lot of it out on your own. But right. basically, where it says chapel, that chapel was destroyed. But this building was built over top of the foundation of that chapel. Gotcha. In 99, it was called the Phoenix Project. Basically, the Patriots, volunteers kept coming out here until it was built. Uh, where it says school bus and pool. You see that on there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that school bus, if you look out this window right here, you can actually see. It's hard to see it from here, but there's a sign that says keep out. And then there's a little yellow sign to the left of that. You see that? Yes, sir. And that's actually, hi, welcome. If you look to the left, you can actually see a little bit of that school bus. Yes, sir, I see it. It is okay to go over there and, and walk around and look at that. It's mainly marked keep out so that uh, uh, real little ones aren't over there so they don't fall you know, down in, into that school bus and stuff. But you guys right. can look at it. Just kind of watch your step if you go over there. But you can go over there and look at it. And that pool is directly to the right. You see that? Mm. Uh, my so in that pool is Everybody. also interesting because if you look along the up just above the water line of the pool, there's actually a ring of ashes. And on the second stair of the pool, it looks like David left some graffiti that says DK92 and there's a star of David. Because what we have now determined is that pool is actually the basement of a giant machine shed that was built here. Do you see in that black and white photo right there? Right here. Up the line? Yeah. Yeah. The, the top one though. See the top one? Oh yes, sir. See that building there? Yes, sir. That building was built in 1985. David left here with all of his followers in 1984. They didn't return till 87. They stayed in Palestine, Texas in the uh, interim. But what we have determined now is that during that time, between 85 and 87, the son of Ben and Lois Roden, actually, he had political aspirations. Uh, he took over the property after David left. And he actually, we determined now, was working with the Epstein group. Have you ever heard of Jeffrey Epstein? Yes, sir. So and he did not kill himself. Exactly. 
It was during uh, uh, it was during that time that George Roden, uh, the son of Ben and Lois Roden, who was willing to do anything to run this property, uh, and he was finally David left in '84. His mother Lois uh, uh, had terminal cancer and was in the last stages, was on bed rest. So George took over. He actually had political aspirations. He ran for Democratic president in '76. He didn't get that far, but he mounted a campaign and. He was working with the Epstein Group and uh, allowing this place to be used for child trafficking and gun trafficking. So when David came back in 1987, George actually opened fire on David and just a handful of followers he initially brought. And uh, there was a two-way gun battle. The authorities were called. Everybody got arrested. Uh, David and his handful of followers were found innocent in 87 and freed, and George got a six-month sentence. Wow. So when David and his followers rolled back on the property in 87 in their buses, David wrote in his newsletter that he found terrible things in the bottom of that machine shed, uh, that it was desecrated, so he decided to do a water cleansing and turn it into a pool, mm -hmm. which seemed strange because you would have thought having over 100 people, he could have turned that into apartments. It was almost a new building or a kitchen or something, but he said it was desecrated. He turned it into a pool. And um, also, uh, what's interesting is David wrote this newsletter. He found uh, 2,000 automatic rifles uh, with no serial numbers. 2,000 automatic rifles with no serial numbers. Epstein style child pornography because we now know a book just came out three months ago documenting how Jeffrey Epstein uh, was very careful to document when he's getting leads. It's all about this child trafficking shit. It was a bunch of creeps out here, man. Banging kids. It's fucking gross. A person we now know to be involved in this Epstein network based on flight records to Lolita Island is our former president, Bill Clinton. He came uh, yep. close to this location, about two miles away, to a power plant located just up the runway at the time, where on August 28th of 1992, he had a campaign stop with Al Gore. They had their regular campaign stop. There's pictures of it online. They have on the hard hats. But we're told that after that, they had a gathering of Texas law enforcement, like the head of the Texas Rangers, uh, the head of the police here, the, the county sheriff, the county attorney. Um, and the county attorney represented us later on a separate matter related to us that actually um, uh, this did occur. They, they went out, they were led up to a high town area and looked down over the, uh, you could see this area, and the Bill Clinton seemed visibly upset to see that that machine shed area where we think he knew there was evidence had been torn up and turned into a pool, and then he immediately said, I want that place to investigate for child trafficking and for gun trafficking. And we think that that really explains why there was never authority given from Washington just to do the simple thing and just arrest David. Because David was known, uh, the ATF set up their command center two months before the raid and were doing careful surveillance, and they knew that David jogged five miles off the property by himself outside the gates every day, never tried to arrest him even once. David and one follower approached, knocked on the door, because they thought it was new neighbors moved in, because they, when they, the authorities moved in, they did it undercover, playing close. So David and one follower knocked on the door, brought a bunch of pizzas, pizzas and boxes, said, hi neighbors, uh, here's your welcome gift. And the ATF officer opens the door, plain closed, and says, oh, thank you, and then slams the door in David's face. So again, it seems like there was no authority just to arrest David. Even uh, the ATF uh, negotiator was good at his job. He was steadily getting out women and children uh, during the first month. You would have thought he would have got a pay raise, a promotion, uh, uh, more authority within the scenario. He got none of those. He got sacked. He got sent back to Washington to reprimand it. Uh, so they didn't want it to stop? That, no, because we think, uh, here's what will explain it. Now, on the last day of the raid, uh, just before the fire, there's an audio recording we have preserved where ATF are radioing into their commander. We've located the suspect, David Koresh. We're two feet away from him, but through a wall. Mm -hmm. We have permission to breach the wall and take the suspect down. Their commander says, wait a minute, I need to check with Washington. And after a brief delay, he gets back and he says, no. I repeat, no. Washington said, no. Uh, do not take the suspect. Washington has another plan in place. Repeat, Washington has another plan in place. Now the evidence is that other plan in place was just to burn it all down, and then they took a nine-month period where they blocked off the road he drove in on, brought in a bulldozer in the first seven days. Covering up, there's evidence. 
yeah, uh, brought sifter, sifted through it, brought in 11 dump trucks, toting away evidence, brought a scraper in towards the end of the nine months, scraping even all the way two feet of topsoil from the horse pasture and all the way up to even that dirt with them, okay? And that, that was the plan all along. And other evidence I have of that is I just was told by a neighbor last week that his experience was when all this went down and he saw all this military and stuff, he was scared. And he saw some soldiers standing over in a field near his property and he approached them and they searched him and everything, but uh, thankfully they didn't shoot him. And then he said that he asked him, should he, could he leave? Could he get an escort and leave with his family? And they kind of laughed at him and said, we're not going to escort you. And he said they had on just completely plain military uniform, black uniform, no insignia, no name tags, no flags, no nothing, all black. But then they said, you need to get out of here and don't come back for two months. So what's interesting about that is that's an indication that it was known right from the beginning that it was a two-month procedure. It wasn't mm -hmm. just an accident where they said, well, the fire started one day. We don't know what happened. It was actually intended that it was going to last just later. within that time period. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another interesting factor about it. Right. It also is interesting to note the reason why David left in 1984 was because our current pastor had come here based on the invitation of Lois Rose. She invited all the church members to come back in 84 and keep Passover here at the headquarters and when Pastor Charles Page returned he approached Lois and asked her if he could give a sermon to the whole group and she agreed to it there was 180 church members including some of them lived here but some of them had come in for Passover and Pastor Page decided to go ahead and confront David's primary teaching where David was claiming to be the lamb of Revelation 5 the only one that could open up the sealed book and Pastor Page pointed out if you carefully read Revelation 5 and 6 that's impossible because it actually says that that lamb is not any man on earth or any man under the earth which eliminates David but it gets into next a much more sublime messianic type of truth that for myself was very difficult to accept at first because it's a truth that is not commonly taught or understood by most Bible students. But if you go back and look at the original scriptures carefully and even go back to the Greek, it's in there. And what it actually says is it says that that lamb is not a heavenly male. And if you go back to the Greek, it says that she's the Arneon lamb, which is the female or diminutive lamb of the Aran lamb. And the Aran lamb is the lamb used as the lamb of God for Jesus throughout the New Testament. But this Arneon lamb is a different lamb. It says she has seven horns, full authority, seven eyes, full knowledge, and that she is the seven spirits of God. In other words, she is the Holy Spirit. And so David was told that by continuing to teach and preach that he was that lamb, he was actually blaspheming. And he was actually... Uh, um, fulfilling the prophecy of the founder of our church, uh, Ellen White, who's pictured there uh, on that poster. She prophesied in 1904 that we would see a movement in our church called the Omega of Apostasy. Uh, similar to the Alpha of Apostasy in Heaven when Lucifer led a movement said that he had the mind of God and he was the only one that could open up God's deep secrets and he would sit in the seat of God and gain a following of angels. We were told we would see a man in our church gain a similar following and try to do similar things, but that this would be a foreshadowing of the final Antichrist movement. That not that David was the final Antichrist, right. but he was like a picture of the Antichrist within our church to right. show us what that would how be. How it was going to turn out. And that according to that, exactly how it would turn out, and according to Ezekiel 28, it says that it would turn out by God sending the most terrible army of the nations down upon the movement and asking this man, now that you're in the hands of the most terrible armies of the nations, how much do you feel like a god now? And kindle a fire in the midst of the movement. So this was warned and told to David in 1984. And David was directly asked and confronted and asked, Are you this apostate leader coming into our church to lead this tragically ending movement, ending in a fiery end? And David gets up, walks in the group of 100, in the middle of the group of 180 church members, and says, Somebody's got to do it. It might as well be me. Puts his arm around our current pastor, turns him to the elders, and says, This brother is teaching the truth. Listen to him. And then David sits down calmly and politely. And so it seemed like that resolved it. But by the next day, it was clear that David's followers felt different, except for maybe one exception. They were saying, we found our lamb. And nobody's going to tell us anything different, not even David. So they organized a study separate from David the next day where they were trying to prove from the Bible that David was still the lamb of Revelation 5. And we think, in, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, that because they rejected the love for the truth revealing the Antichrist spirit, God gave them their free will choice and sent them strong delusion. And they truly began to believe that David was God. So point. David split the church. In, so, was it intentionally? Yeah. or? So at that point, David, within seven days, took his followers off the property. Because he had admitted on this property he wasn't really the lamb. But they were insisting that he was. And uh, 
So as far as whether it was an intentionally, see, we think it's interesting what David did when he said uh, somebody's got to do it because he was agreeing to fulfill a prophecy that wasn't a nice prophecy. Right. It was a prophecy that had a horrible end for him. Yeah. And it was a prophecy that basically said an apostate is somebody who accepts the truth initially and then goes backwards on it. And that's what he did. Yeah. He accepted the truth in front of everybody that he wasn't really the lamb, but then he went backwards on it and started teaching he was the lamb, that he was God and everything else. And so uh, we think that it was it was really a... a uh, 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 it's something that I it's something I don't even think I could do. If God asked me to do that, I don't think I could do it. Right. Okay. So David just agreed to do it. So we think that that's pretty amazing by itself. Um, and uh, what, what's interesting is that it was after then David left in 1984 that then, as I've already related to you guys, things got politically interested, interesting here because that's when George Rode, the son of Ben and Lois Rode, took over and, and started to you know work with the Epstein group and, and get into all that kind of stuff too. Right. And also now I don't know I don't think I mentioned to you guys um, I forget sometimes who I'm talking to. But because people come, but let me tell you because I don't think I told you guys this interesting detail. It wasn't just that whole Epstein child trafficking scheme was not only related to Bill Clinton, even though Clinton was involved in it. Mm -hmm. We know that it also was connected to other officials like George Bush Sr., who we now know uh, the evidence is showing that he was quite a pedophile mm -hmm. and was involved with Epstein as well. Mm -hmm. George Bush Sr. was the Texas land commissioner before he was then the Texas governor and later the president of the United States. He set aside 20,000 acres of land, which is just past, like right past here, there's a cattle ranch, and right past that cattle ranch is the 20,000 acres he set aside. He gave part of it to the Methodist Boys Ranch, which we think would have been ideal as a place to get young, vulnerable, you know, boys that mm -hmm. didn't have a support structure, mm -hmm. orphans. And then also, the other part of it is given to this huge mansion that's over there surrounded by trees. It's hard to see it unless you can get, there's a part where you can just see the roof over, there's an angle, you, but really it almost takes a drone if you want to get a good look because right. of how they have the trees surrounded. But what's interesting is the neighbors have always complained that there were always, at that time period, huge gay parties over there. But not that's not, but that's really not, it's not just that, because it wasn't just a rave or something like that. Right. What it was is something beyond that because there were always be fully armed paramilitary guards right and they had a private airfield over there i think it was christ landing that might not be the right name i know what i remember is the name has the name word christ in it which i think is blasphemous what they were using it for and they were flying in elites judges politicians to go to these parties these private parties and then after they would start the child trafficking over there at that mansion some of them then would agree to come over here to this property. There were 13 little white single family houses that pre-existed David's time that had been here for many years that then we believe George was allowing them to use along with that machine shed area. There were actually cages in the bottom of that machine shed mm -hmm. um, as well. And uh, that actually they, the children would be trafficked and then they were, they, were, they were probably secretly had hidden cameras to photograph all of it. But those little white houses started right about just like behind here but next to the road like in that direction and they were spaced off and, and went all the way down past that curve all the home that's down there when you would have thought initially that david would have wanted to use those because he had over 100 people in the house i got a question he said they were desecrated and tore them up go ahead outside yeah. of uh like the child sex trafficking and the pedophilia do you think any of this stuff had anything to do with the current adrenochrome conspiracy definitely i think you're definitely on to something right there i'm glad you brought that up we do because of the fact that we even have some evidence that during that whole time period there were bodies found here. Yeah. There were children's bodies found here. And that it goes along with that too because to produce that that substance they want to basically torture them or scare them. Mm -hmm. right? And it's still 1,200 kids going missing every single day in America. Exactly. Yeah. We think it was definitely connected. I mean... Uh, I think definitely it was definitely connected because I think that that adrenochrome, what we're going to find more and more, is connected to the whole Epstein ring. Yeah. Okay. Because he was a person who was just trafficking in so many children, and we know that he was using children for sex. But now we find out it wasn't just that. It's because he wanted to have his whole island. He was so secretive too. But I mean, another gentleman just came here from I believe it was New Mexico, where there's a similar ranch because this was he had similar setups in different states. Okay, and they would almost always, there would be a mansion, there would be a private airport, so that way they could, you know, fly mm -hmm. the people in and out, go to, have their uh, 
trafficking parties in the mansion. And, you know, certainly uh, uh, with everything we're learning about this whole adrenochrome, I think it is, it, it's very likely. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, I believe, I believe that definitely did occur. We're just waiting to get more and more confirmation. Part of the difficulty here is that uh, the government actually keeps very careful records. Mm -hmm. We even had a, a gentleman that came out here that's still in some level of the government. He didn't say exactly what it was, but he pointed out the government keeps careful records. But here's the thing, Bill Clinton classified it for 25 years and then Obama reclassified it for another 25 years. So that makes it more difficult. And, you know, we, of course, don't think that it should be classified still because, it's, you know, all the, most of the officials have either retired or, you know, it's not like it, it's, it's going to compromise active uh, uh, operations and stuff because most, it's been so many years that it Most passed. likely they'll declassify it when I was on dead and gone. What's that? They'll probably declassify it after they're dead and gone. Yeah, that's that's their that we think that that's probably their intention. But Jesus made a comment and said everything done in secret is going to come out into the light. So we think that ultimately it's all going to be revealed in God's timing, uh, and we think it'll probably be sooner than what they would like. Because we actually believe that even though the Bible says First Peter four seventeen judgment begins in the house of God. That's why uh, David and his movement were judged here first. But we also think, just like our pastor was used to reveal the spiritual error in David's teaching, claiming to be the Lamb of Revelation 5, that David was I used think it's all about adrenochrome. It was raping these kids out here, uh, 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 killing them and sucking their blood and shit, and trying to live forever. It's on real creepy and shit. shit. Get rid of human life. And we think that was revealed here. And a lot of people have taken notice of that. And that before God is going to judge something, some people say too big to fail. But here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to God, there's nothing too big to fail. So we think that our government is under God's judgment. But before he fully judges it and executes his judgment on the government, he's going to reveal to us. And he's starting to do that more and more now. That's why, even though they try to hide so many things with Epstein and, and you know, his uh, you know, the tape of his suicide disappeared and all that kind of mm -hmm. garbage. We know, but people still generally know. I mean, that, that that's garbage. We know it's not true. And there have been so many revelations we've learned about Epstein and his political connections that, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't know any of that. Right. It wasn't in the news. But here's another thing I think is interesting. The doors, the front doors from the time of the standoff were right about where these doors are. Just roughly, they were there. Now, on the right side of the door was where the government had shot in and there were mostly incoming shots on the left side of the door was the door where people inside had shot out but there weren't as many shots but there were some shots going through the door okay mm -hmm. the government all of a sudden said that the right side of the door either melted in the fire which is very unlikely that, it's, that, that it's, it was a metal door mm -hmm. okay or that it disappeared I think it disappeared just like Jeffrey Epps, just like the video of Jeffrey Epps being suicide right. disappeared. Yeah, right. It disappeared, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, the modern day technology got them like assassinated. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But because of the fact that that door was would have really evidenced the massive firepower that the government was shooting in it, mm -hmm. they, they didn't want that shown. Exactly. And, and also, uh, what's interesting is they, they claim on the first day of the raid that there's officers claiming. Uh, ATF were claiming it was it was I was in Vietnam. It was worse than Vietnam while they were shooting at us. But the videos are there, and you can see them. They're hiding behind their cars and their car doors and shooting. Mm -hmm. There is not one uh, shot, ricochet, hole to the windshield, hole in the metal of the cars. If they were being shot at like it was Vietnam, you're going to have at least one broken window mm -hmm. of the squad car of the cars and that they had. Riddle of bullets. Exactly, and there's not even one. Now, here's another interesting factor. Um, are you guys familiar with what happened in the vault area? No. So the vault area, which is pictured there uh, with great big walls. Now, if you look at it outside, what you're going to see okay. is because, see, now the, though, that was originally made as a storm shelter, and it was made as, to survive like tornado or hurricane wind, so it had steel or not, uh, or concrete rather concrete reinforced walls. So the government took all that away, except for just there's part of a slab that's near the pool over here. But other than that, the main thing we have left of it, if you look, when you go outside or if you look out that window, it looks like just a square hole cut in the concrete in the ground. 
And then they filled a lot of it in with rocks because it was like an actual room that was underground, like a basement type of room. But what's the, the vault is one of the saddest tragedies of all because what happened there, what happened there is that basically a uh, typical warfare scenario when they decide that um, uh, in order to hopefully save the women and children, even if the men lose the armed conflict, they're going to take the women and children unarmed and put them in another spot in the mm -hmm. hopes that they won't have to die even if the men lose the battle. Right? right. So that's what they get. So it was only women and children, mothers and children down in that vault, all unarmed. But what happened is the tank commander testified at the congressional hearings that he wanted to follow his orders so carefully to insert the CS gas, which is like kind of a big uh, bullet thing that, that shoots out from the tank, that he wanted to make sure he got it right where he was supposed to, that he said he went close enough to that vault area where he could see the mothers looking out the doorway and made sure that he shot those ca gas canisters right down into that vault. But then when all the officials were asked, uh, what were the warnings given on uh, the literature against using CS gas, uh, especially when it was involving small children in a confined area. All the officials developed collective amnesia, probably for liability purposes when they were on the congressional hearings and said, I don't recall, I don't recall. Not a lot of them could recall, right? Because what it says is it says don't use it in that manner because it causes extreme muscle contraction when it's over concentrated. So mm -hmm. all those bodies of women and children were found in that bald area. They didn't die from fire, smoke inhalation, CS gas. or it was from CS gas. And their muscle contraction was so extreme that it made their heads involuntarily want to touch their tailbones. Their skeletons were literally pulled yeah. backwards. A horrible tragedy. And the government was so embarrassed about that that we were later approached by retired highway patrol officers, a lieutenant and another officer under him, who said that in their duty during the nine-month cleanup effort, their duty was to be cordoned out. We were like a human shield during parts of those nine months. And they said they saw things that made them uncomfortable and had some pictures they shared with us. And one of the things they told us is that they saw uh, U-Haul trucks pulled out after everything was over, the fire was out, the, you know, people were out of here, it didn't make sense to do it, but U-Haul trucks pulled up to that vault and unloading automatic weapons down into that vault. And we think that probably that was to develop photography so that then they could say, oh, well, we were justified in doing that. Right. Because, uh, uh, you know, because they had all the weapons, when in reality, they were There was no weapons, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was very sad, especially what happened in that, uh, in that area. Yeah, yeah. Um, and God. Uh, now another thing I'll tell you guys is that uh, another lie the government's trying to push on us is that their first interest in this property was in 1992 and 3 because of David Koresh. Uh -huh. We now know that's complete garbage because something happened here in 1929, which is a significant year for us as a church, because in 1929, our founder, Victor Hoda, pictured in the corner there, he started the movement in Southern California. And one of his main teachings was that, according to Bible verses like Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, not only, uh, that, that's Ben Rodin, and then that one right there is Victor Hoda. Okay. And he actually, uh, when he started the movement in Waco in 1935, we originally obtained 389 acres in Waco proper that included Lake Waco and all the surrounding acreage. That was later exchanged for this property in 1955. But in 1929, uh, Victor Hoda was teaching us that not only does Jesus have a stationary heavenly throne, but according to chapters in the Bible, like Ezekiel chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 6, he has a movable chariot surrounded by a rainbow or some of the descriptions that it has a throne firing and folding on the throne that is very bright, travels from heaven to earth at a high rate of speed. Victor pointed out to us that if we saw something like that in the modern times, we'd never use King James English and call it a chariot. We might call it a UFO. Right. And in 1929, that same year, before the church had an interest in this property, there was something seen right here. There was a Roswell-type incident. There was a craft that descended at a high rate of speed. And then it was so disturbing to the government that in part of their investigation to it, as they've done with other places in this country, they took over the whole property and turned it into a military base. It was called Conley Army Airfield. Now, that's to be distinguished from James Connolly Air Force Base, which is near here, but it's a newer, bigger Air Force yes, Base. But Connolly Army Airfield, they took over the property, turned it into a military base, held it till 55 when they sold it to the church. And because that overlap World War II, it turns out there was another racist chapter in the government's history that occurred here during World War II. According to the Homeland Security Investigator Ken Fawcett, uh, 
there was a division of the Japanese internment prison camp run out here, which was very racist because they didn't interview a single Japanese American to ask them if they were allegiant to the emperor. Maybe there's some that were, but they never interviewed any of them. They just assumed based on race they all were, even to the extent they were patriotic young Japanese American soldiers volunteered, some died for our country, some of them came back without an arm or leg, and were told, you're discharged, but we know you're secretly allegiant to that emperor and your family. Report straight to the prison camp, your family's already there, confiscated all their property, and that, the biggest one was in Southern California, but there was a regional division right here, and uh, the Homeland Security Investigator, Ken Fawcett, said that that building that's behind the school bus that looks like a great big hollowed out basement, if you see it, is the remnants of the uh, command center for the Japanese internment uh, that have been out here. So that we think is another uh, tragedy that occurred out here. Do you? And, yeah. Do you think land could be cursed? That's a good question, and I'll answer you. I actually think it's blessed, and here's okay. why I'm saying that. In the Bible, we had a saying that came up at the time of Jesus: "Nothing good can come out of Nazareth. It's a rotten place. Forget about it." But that was done by the devil to hide the fact that this huge blessing was actually going to come out of Nazareth, which was Jesus. Right. Okay? So the same thing we believe is what's going on here. We think that this is a blessed property. Okay? But the devil's doing anything he can to make people just scared. And stuff. I mean, I respect people like you that are actually asking questions. Some people get out here and are so scared. They get out here and they look through their car window like it's a zoo and then they zoom out and they're not. They're right. Not, they're because of the scared, stigma. Scared. And exactly. You, and you can feel the energy coming out here. It's, it's like a scary energy. Right. right. Well, based off yeah. what you've heard out there. So. Yeah. But that's based on what you heard. But when you actually get here, you'll notice there's a peaceful spirit. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so basically... We think that this whole area, the old name for it, was called uh, Jerusalem and the Bracelets de Dios, Jerusalem and the Arms of God. This area, actually, we and just not only right here, but this whole general area, which is now called Waco, uh, we believe is an area designated by God as a sanctuary place. In this country, the Jerusalem of this continent, we got the Jerusalem over in the continent of the Middle East. It's interesting, too, that we're in a direct line to the east. If you travel directly east from here, you hit Jerusalem. So you're on the same ley line? Yeah, exactly, the exact same yes. line. But we think that this is the Jerusalem That's something else, of, really. of this continent that God, the prophecy says that ultimately, it will, the prophecy clearly says there would be a tragedy on the property, but that ultimately God would restore it in such an Edenic fashion that finally in the end, people would come to know this property, not because of the tragedy, but because of the Edenic restoration that it would be built up seven times greater than what it ever previously has. So we're in the process of that. We think we're just in the edges of the time the Bible calls beauty for ashes. The pastor let me put some beautiful Japanese koi in the pool area, which actually has a ring of ashes just above the waterline. But this was before, I didn't even know that that's what it was uh -huh. when he let me put the koi in. And the koi actually have done great. They're getting huge. They've spawned. There's baby koi in there. We think that's God showing us that he is greater even than the worst tragedies. He can take and put something beautiful and alive and growing, even in a place formerly known for tragedy. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too, because now I realize I didn't even know the thing about the Japanese internment at that time. But God is taking something beautiful from Japan, this Japanese koi, and using it to beautify a place that had been a place of oppression of Japanese citizens. And we think that even in general, God is in the process right now of uplifting and blessing all the different groups of people that have formerly been oppressed.